Welcome to the channel, I'm technically not a technician, and in today's video we'll be exploring how to install Nova Launcher, Button Mapper, RetroArch, and a few of your favorite repackaged APK files after you've installed the Mystery Dawson experience. We've picked this combination of apps as they seem to give us the largest array of options for the limited hardware we have available to us on the arcade 1UP Simpsons cab. If you've modded your arcade 1UP Simpsons cab in the past, then you're well aware that our largest limitation is drive space. This guide is to show you how to set up your Simpsons arcade cabinet so you can continue to play your stock Simpsons games while simultaneously letting you add your favorite repackaged APK files and using RetroArch so you can play console games with the flexibility to load games from the SD card or other external drive. If you've seen my past videos, you'll be familiar with Nova Launcher, Button Mapper, and the concepts of the repackaged APK files. You may also know about the Simpsons 4 player fix, formerly known as the Mystery Dawson Experience by Team Encoder. I'll now show you how we'll use RetroArch to load your game ROM files from your SD card in combination with both the repackaged APK files and the 4 player fix. This video is for educational purposes only and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any videos or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. With the intro and all the legal mumbo jumbo out of the way, let's get started. This video assumes that you've installed and patched the Mystery Dawson 4 player fix as shown in this video. If you have not, then go watch that video, because without it, you will not get the same results. I also feel that I should point out that you'll want to check out my video on the low battery bug. This is optional. However, this fix keeps my emulated battery in check and helps me negate the low battery bug effect. You can find the links for both videos in the description. As far as items you'll need, we will need an SD card. For this mod, I do recommend that you get a large SD card so you can add large ROM files like TurboGrafx CD-ROMs. I also recommend that you get a 3U rated SD card, as they have a high rate for read and write speeds. We'll also need a keyboard and mouse. I recommend an all-in-one wireless combo as it only takes up one USB port, and generally they're smaller and easier to hide when not in use. With your arcade 1UP Simpsons cab freshly modified with the Mystery Dawson 4 player fix and all the tools in hand, let's remove the back of the cab, insert our USB keyboard and mouse combo, and work at getting the SD card formatted as external or portable storage. To start this process, we'll need to press the Windows and N key at the same time. This action will open an Android submenu that we'll need to expand. Once you have the submenu expanded, you'll need to click on the settings icon at the bottom right hand side of the submenu. This will open a settings menu, and we'll need to navigate to the storage area of this menu and select that option. After you've selected the storage option, you'll need to move your cursor to the top right hand side, where you can see three dots. When you hover over these three dots, you'll get a message saying, more options. Please make that selection now. Once done, you get a new menu, and here we'll select storage options. You'll now have two options. One to format as internal storage, and the other is to format it as a portable drive. That is the option that we need. It has been reported that formatting the card to internal storage will make the system operate unpredictably, and it's been reported that when members of our community have used this option to install too, they have bricked the PCB and had to replace that hardware. Again, please format your SD card as a portable external drive. After making our selection, a new pop-up menu will be in view. This pop-up wishes to verify that we'll be formatting the drive, and it reminds us that all data will be removed from the SD card if we move forward. In this section, we'll select the Format SD Card option. We'll now need to press Done, and eject the SD card from the arcade cab, and then we'll move the SD card over to the computer to copy the needed files. On your PC, you'll need to navigate to the description of the very video you're watching, and you'll need to find the link under Helpful Files. After finding the link in the description, click on the link, then look for a compressed 7-zip file called Retro Simpsons 1, and download that file. I've placed all the APK files, icons, and images that you'll need in this zipped folder. Files you must provide. BIOS files. Some BIOS files are optional but all of the emulator cores that RetroArch uses work better with the BIOS files. So we do recommend getting your hands on some. 
you can find BIOS file packs that people put together on Google and the Internet Archive. You're also going to need ROM files. Again, you'll have to provide these yourself. I will not link to them or help you find them, so please don't ask. You can use Google, and I will say that for consoles, it's very easy to use no intro ROM sets. They work very well for old retro platforms, and for arcades, just make sure the set you have matches the version of the emulator core you're using. The last thing you'll need to provide is repackaged arcade 1UP APKs. As you know, a few of these have been made. I'll be using the old Sunset Riders APK called Droid K00. This is an older repackaged APK, and I'm sure many of you are aware of the anonymous community member going by the handle, the programmer, that's repackaged and reprogrammed many APKs for the community to use. I recommend those, as they are much better, with more games and better art, and I do want to take a second and thank the programmer for all of the hard work you've done. Thank you for sharing your amazing skills with the rest of us. Now let's speak about the files I will be providing you. As I stated earlier, you will need to download the Retro Simpsons 1 zip file from the link provided in the description. After you've downloaded it, locate the file, then move it to an area that is easy to find, and extract these files so they are placed in the same area as the others. Extracting these files shouldn't take long, and when you're done, you'll have two new folders. One called APK, and the second is called Pictures. When finished with the file extraction, feel free to delete the 7-zip file as it will no longer be needed. I would also recommend that we move the Droid K00 file over to the APK folder to make everything look nice and easy to find. When you're in the APK folder, you'll see that I've already downloaded the following programs for your convenience, Button Mapper, Nova Launcher, and RetroArch. I do wish to point out that this is a new version of Button Mapper. I believe the old one will work, but this new one does have some great new options. There isn't any change with Nova Launcher. However, I do want to point out that the RetroArch that I've supplied does have some of the control setup done for you out of the box by Mystery Encoder. This is the same file you'll find in the Mystery Dawson Experience download, and using this version of RetroArch will help save time. The second is a Pictures folder, and it will have two folders in it. One will be an Icon folder. In the Icon folder, I've placed three images I plan on using as icons. One is for the stock Simpsons APK, the second is for the repackaged Sunset Riders APK, and the third and last icon is for RetroArch. I've also made a new wallpaper for this build, but my wallpapers stink, and I'd recommend using one from community member Alex V, and I'll make sure to link to his channel. As well as to his work on Simpsons wallpapers in the description. Now that we have all of our files in order, we'll need to move the files to the SD card we wish to use. This SD card will remain in the arcade cab, and we'll not only use it to install our APK files as we've done in the past, but we'll also be using the SD card as storage for all of our ROMs. This step will take a ton of time if you have a ton of game ROMs. For this guide, I'll be using a scaled down set, however, you do not have to limit yourself. Please feel free to use any 2-button, 8-way game ROM you wish. It is important to remember that the more games you add, the more time this will take. I'll be fast forwarding this to save time. We now have all of our game ROMs, images, and APK files moved to the SD card, so we'll eject the SD card from our PC and transfer the SD card to our Simpsons Arcade 1UP cabinet. First, we'll place the SD card back into our Simpsons cab, and after placing the card back in, we'll then need to boot the cab. I'm not plugging the USB keyboard mouse combo in yet, as I don't wish to see the warning message regarding the device. Before moving forward, I do want to remind everyone that you will want to have the Mystery Dawson experience installed and patched before moving to this step. If you do not, you will not have the same outcome as I have. With that said, I'll plug in the USB dongle for my wireless keyboard and mouse combo, and we'll press the N and Windows keys together to open the Android OS menu. We'll then navigate to the settings icon at the bottom right hand side and select that option. This gives us access to a number of options, and again, we'll need to select the storage option as we did when formatting our SD card. Once we've navigated to our SD card, look for and find the folder titled APK, and open that folder. At this time, you should be face to face with all four of the APK files that we'll need to install and set up. Install each, but when you're done installing them, make sure that you do not open the app. Simply click done when finished. 
We will set him up, but we'll wish to set each up in order. I do wish to say that when installing RetroArch, you will be presented with an extra step, and this is fine. Simply agree and move forward. Once everything is installed, we'll need to set it all up. Our first step in doing so is setting up Nova Launcher. This happy little app is first because it will act as a launch screen for all of the other apps, and because of this, later in the video, we'll set it up as the default home screen. Our first step will simply be setting it up. We'll need to back out of the storage area and enter the apps and notifications area, and when in this section, find the icon that corresponds to Nova Launcher and start that app. Once the app is started, you must confirm permissions, and you'll be presented with a configurations page. Once you've navigated to the configurations page, you'll be deselecting as many options as we can. Basically, we're setting this up to be as kiosk-like as we can. When we get to the bottom, make sure under the dock options you select none. Once done, pull the screen down as far as you can, and you'll be given a red check mark to confirm your options. After finding the red check mark and selecting it, you're going to get kicked out of Nova, and the system will back you back into the Simpsons stock app. This is normal, and as you can see, mine is even playing the ROM demo in the background. All we must do is re-enter the Android OS menu again by pressing the N and Windows keys at the same time. We're not done with Nova yet, so we'll need to find the apps and notifications section again and reopen Nova Launcher. Once Nova Launcher is started, you'll be given a blank home screen with two icons. Clicking and holding these icons individually will give you a sub-menu for each, with an option to remove the icon. Please select remove for each of these icons, as we've no need of them, and we'll be adding custom icons for the apps we wish to access with our cab controls. Next, we'll need to select a simple background image to use as a wallpaper. I'm not a pro with image building, editing, or manipulation. However, I have provided you with a sample you may use. The wallpaper supplied has the correct aspect ratio and resolution. This said, I personally feel that, creatively speaking, my art stinks. You'll wish to set this up as the wallpaper, and I always use it for both the home screen and the locked screen. Not that I'm sure it matters in how you set your home screen. Next, we'll need to set icons, and the first I wish to do is RetroArch. In my past videos, I'm not sure I've been clear in setting these icons up. Many people have come to me with questions that seem to revolving around icons not being in the right place or disappearing altogether. At this point, I wish to quickly set up this RetroArch, kind of on the fly, and let you see where the icon has gone and how you can fix this issue. In short, Nova Launcher gives you two landing pages as home screens, and when configuring your icons, Nova seems to add these icons to the far right screen. When this happens to me, I simply pull the right side screen forward and remove the RetroArch icon. I pull back to the first home screen on the left side, and I start again. I've no idea why Nova does this. I'd assume that the system would default icons to the first home page. However, this doesn't seem to be the case. Now that we have that explanation out of the way and we are on the far left hand side of the home screen, I do wish to walk you through setting up the RetroArch icon. Basically, in the Nova menu, we grab the action icon and drop it into the area where we wish to use it. Then it will ask us to assign an action to that icon. When asked what action to use for this icon, we'll need to point it to RetroArch and tell it to use RetroArch's first action. If you're not in the Nova menu, you can gain access by pressing and holding any blank open area on your home screen. Once you've dropped your icon in the area you wish it to be, press and hold the icon, and an icon editing menu will open. Here, you may wish to edit the name of the icon, and I know I wish to change it out. In the past, I've used transparent icons. However, this time I want to use small arcades for each. To do so, we'll press the icon image when in the icon edit menu, and we'll be given a few options to pick from. In this section, we'll wish to select gallery and select the icon I made that corresponds to the RetroArch app. After that, simply unclick on the resize option, and you're ready to rock and roll. We'll now wish to do the same thing for both the Droid K00 app, which has the Sunset Riders ROM in it, and we'll wish to do the same for the Stock A1 Up or Simpsons APK that has the Simpsons Bowling and Simpsons Fighting Games. Again, if you wish to use other APK files, different icons, or other wallpapers, that is fine. This is just to show you how I've set mine up and to give you some great ideas for your build. I'm not going to walk you through setting up the Simpsons or the Sunset Riders icons. 
As you've seen, the retroarch icons have been done twice, and at this point, reviewing the processes for these two APKs seems repetitive, and for time, I feel it would be better to speed this section of the video up. I do wish to ask that, as you wait, you consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and sharing this video on your social media or with a friend. These little actions really help this channel grow. Thank you. We now have Nova Launcher and our home screen set up with all of our icons. However, we're not done yet, as we'll need to set up our Android cab to open Nova Launcher when the system boots up. This isn't hard to do at all, as we again simply access the Android OS menu and navigate to the Apps and Notifications section. When in Apps and Notifications, find the subsection that's called Default Apps, then enter that section, and find the Home App option at the top. Here we need to change it from None to Nova, and when done, we'll get kicked back into the Nova Home screen. With Nova Launcher set up, let's open Button Mapper and start the setup process for this app. To start, we need to re-enter the Android OS menu, pull the expanded menu down, and click on the setup icon. Now find the Apps and Notification section, click that option, and then expand the program options and look for the program titled Button Remapper. Click on that option and open the Button Remapper program. Once Button Remapper is open, look at the top right corner and enable accessibility, and a sub-menu will open. Simply click on the Continue option, and you'll be taken to a new menu. Here, under Download Service, you'll see Button Remapper, and you'll need to click on that icon, then enable the Use Services option at the very top. You'll be given another sub-menu, and here you'll need to click on the Allow option. Button Remapper is now set up, and now we need to configure it to help us exit back to Nova when we wish to exit an APK file. Setting this up is almost the same as in the old version. We simply press the plus in the bottom corner, and this changes the menu. Here, we'll press the combination option in the middle. This gives us a configuration menu where we'll change what key we wish to use and what action that key will take. In short, we'll be setting this up to exit the APK files if the live key is pressed twice quickly. Once we're done configuring the button remapper and the live key, we simply need to back out of the Android OS menus and get back to the Nova home screen. So far, everything seems to be working well, but I do wish to test and verify that Button Remapper, Nova, and the Live Key are all working well with one another and that I'll be able to exit each of the APK files as needed by pressing the Live Key twice. It will also be nice to get the one-time allow permissions message out of the way on the Sunset Riders APK. As I'm doing so, please remember to like, comment, hit that notification button, and if you've not already, subscribe to the channel. It means the world to this little channel, thank you. The last app that we need to set up is RetroArch. We'll use this as a front-end for emulator cores, and when we first open the program, it will need to extract a few files. As it does so, I do wish to point out that we're able to use all four player controls. However, it is important to understand that with this four player fix, the live key will be used as the select button and is tied to the player one red controls. Just remember that when you start RetroArch you must use the red controls first, or you'll not be able to exit the game. More on this later. The version of RetroArch that I'm using today is the one that has some of the controls pre-configured by one of the members of Team Encoder, and you'll be able to find it in my download or in the Mystery Dawson Experience download. That said, the very first thing I wish to do is find and navigate to the directory section and tell RetroArch where I've placed the BIOS files for all of the consoles. It happens to be the very first selection under the directory section, and when selected, you're given the option to find your SD card and identify the folder that has your files. I do wish to point out that the folder identified as C101-0B0E will be different for you. We do wish to point RetroArch to the BIOS folder, and when done, back out and navigate to the File Browser section, navigate to the Storage section, and select the Use this directory option when you see the subfolder C101-0B0E. Next, we need to back out of the directory section and navigate up to the on-screen display. Here, we have options like on-screen notifications and overlays. I'm going to keep the notifications for now, but I know I don't want the control overlays, so I'll be turning those off. We'll now back out of the on-screen display section, and we'll head to the port 1 controls. Most of the controls have been taken care of by one of the members of Team Encoder. However, we do have a few changes that still need to be made. 
Basically, under port 1 in the input section, we'll need to scroll down to the select button and map it to the live key. The live button, now programmed as the select button, only works with the Red Player 1 controls. What complicates this is that RetroArch also assigns controllers based on which controller is used first. So if you use Blue Player 2 first, it will connect Blue Player 2 as Player 1, and you no longer have access to the Live button, and you can't exit a game when you're done playing. Again, more on this later. The next one is optional, but under the Menu Controls option, if you wish, find the All Users Control Menu option and enable that so any player controller can navigate RetroArch and start games. As far as I can tell, the only thing you can't do is exit a game. Under the hotkeys section, we have a few options in regards to exiting games or simply exiting RetroArch altogether. As far as whether you want the system to exit the app or only close the game, it is up to you. If you wish to completely close the game, you simply select the button combo, and you're ready to exit. You will need to set your live button, as your hotkey, so don't forget to do that. For those of you who are unaware, you can use the hotkey to assign menu functions to in-game controls. This lets you do things like fast forward, rewind, or save a game. Basically, you press the hotkey and the corresponding assigned key for that hotkey functionality. I don't want this guide to get too crazy, so I'm not going to get too much into it. However, I will use the live button as a hotkey, and I wish to close a game or close content and not close out RetroArch altogether when I get done playing a game. So I'll set quick controller combo back to none, and I'll be using the hotkey function of close content, and I'll assign the red player one button as the key to close the game content. We now need to back out of the hotkeys and input section and move to the main RetroArch menu. Here we need to select load core, and because we've not done so, we'll need to download cores. Here is another area where there is no right or wrong answer. You should pick the cores you like and that work with your ROM sets. For a Simpsons build, I personally wish to store or install as little data on the onboard storage as I can. The hard part of that issue is that some things, like the APK files, work better using onboard storage. In truth, game thumbnails work best on the Simpsons cab using the onboard storage, but they take up so much room they leave space for very little. To help conserve space, I recommend only installing what is needed, and if you can, store as much as you can on your SD card. For this guide, I'm simply going to pick one core per system, and I'd also recommend only downloading one core at a time. We now need to back completely out of the cores section and navigate to the settings section. Once in the settings section, look for and find the user interface menu. After you've found the user interface section, you can give the build a nice facelift by changing the layout to XMB after you've made this change, we'll want to back out of the settings menu and go back to the main menu area. In the main menu area, we'll want to find the configuration file menu, and we'll want to save this current configuration. Then we'll simply restart RetroArch, and we'll be presented with a much nicer interface that looks more fitting to be a front-end. Again, I don't want to get crazy in the details of how you can mod your cab, but RetroArch does give you a ton of options. I love how this XMB theme has an effective vertical versus horizontal menu. It's a great option. Speaking of options, I've decided that I'm going to turn off game thumbnails completely. To do so, I'll find the settings icon. I'll then scroll down to the user interface section again, and I'll find the thumbnail option and set it to off. This will keep the thumbnails from trying to download. In truth, I've built setups that download to the SD card. However, RetroArch only seems to like to pull information off the SD card, and RetroArch seems to have a harder time writing data to it. There is another section I wish to show you that can help clean things up. This is still in the settings area, and it's called menu item visibility. It is an optional step, and you don't need to do this. Regardless, it's nice to know about. This area can help cut down on the menu items that you have to select from, like music and images. If you're not planning to use some of these and you want a cleaner look, you may wish to check it out and change some of the options on the menus you're presented. It's important to point out that after making changes, you are required to save your configuration file, and that some of the changes that you make will not take effect until after you have saved the file and restarted RetroArch. Changing the theme and changing these menu items are among those settings, and require a reboot before they take effect. Now that we've cleaned up our icons and everything looks sexy, let's build what RetroArch calls a playlist. This is basically a simple list of all the games you have for each emulator or platform. Like Final Burn Alpha or the classic NES, 
generally speaking, building a playlist is very easy to do. There are two ways to do it. For both Final Burn Alpha and MAME, I would scan those ROM sets individually. RetroArch seems to see those sets easily, and it takes no time at all to scan. You simply go to manually scan, tell the system where the ROMs are, what system you are scanning, and what the default core is going to be. And in a few seconds, you have all of your games on a nice list that's easy to find. You can also add DAT files to your system if you wish to get highly detailed information about your ROMs. This said, NES and other consoles that are compressed using 7-zip seem to have a harder time being scanned in this way. As you can see, Final Burn took fine to the manual scanning option, and we now have a great list of games for that emulator. However, if you have issues with manually scanning your ROMs, you can do what I did and use the scan directory option. This option takes several hours, however. This is because RetroArch must look inside the compressed file to identify each of my ROMs, but it did pick up all of my ROMs with this option. We're going to let this scan continue unimpeded and come back in an hour or so to check and see if the other playlists, for the other ROM sets, have populated. After waiting for a few hours, the scans have finished, and RetroArch has found all of the ROM sets that we've placed on our SD card. Each set now has a playlist, and we have a way to navigate the playlists and select any game we wish. The systems icon at the top of the screen designates each playlist, and after choosing your system, you can scroll up and down the list to find what you're looking for. To launch a game, we simply need to select the game and press the attack button. Anything that we've manually scanned will launch as shown and we can play the game as intended and with all the controls that come with the cab. As you can see the live button now acts as the coin button, and the player 1 button is now limited to only being a player 1 ready button. When we're done playing and we wish to exit a game, simply press the hotkey and the red player 1 button, and you'll close the game and back out to the retroarch menu. For the games that we did not manually scan, we'll open them in the same way. The only difference is that with the scan directory option we picked to build our game playlist, we didn't have the ability to set these game playlists up with emulator cores. Because of this, we'll be asked to select an emulator core before we can launch. There is a way to edit the playlist, but this video is very long, and again, I don't wish to get too crazy with the details or the length of the video. With the console ROMs, we do have some limitations. The largest limitation is that only Red Player 1 has access to a select button, and if your game requires a select button, then only one person can really play. If my memory is right, some games like Super Mario Bros. 3 and Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link require the select button for some menus. Regardless, exiting the game is the same. You simply press the hotkey and the Red Player 1 button at the same time, and you're exited back into the RetroArch menu. I figured I should show off the 4 player controls, and I figured why not show off those 4 player controls by emulating the Simpsons Arcade on a Simpsons Arcade. Great idea, right? Remember, you only find arcade excitement like this on my channel. In reality, the system emulates the cab very well, and with the Mystery Dawson experience, you'll have control over all 4 players. I'd also like to point out that Final Burn Alpha seems to work very well, as far as ROM sets, RetroArch, and this cab, and with the Mystery Dawson experience, you're able to play a very large list of arcades and consoles. I've got to hand it to everyone at Team Encoder, they really knocked it out of the park with this fix, and our cabs really can benefit from this awesome software modification. I get that emulating The Simpsons on The Simpsons is kind of extra, so I feel I should tell you that I did test a few other 3 and 4 player games and so far all controls have worked. Remember when I said we'd speak more about the Player 1 Red controls? Well, that time is now here. If you start RetroArch and begin with the Red Player 1 controls, everything under this design will work fine. However, if you start RetroArch and begin with any controls other than Red Player 1, you will not be able to exit a game using the hotkey and the Red Player 1 button. You will be forced to power the system down and reboot, or you'll need to plug in a keyboard and mouse combo and exit the system with the keyboard. You can double tap the Live button and use the Button Mapper app to back out to the home page in Nova, but when you reopen RetroArch, you will be in the same game and unable to access the RetroArch menu. As far as my final thoughts go, overall, this cab is a ton of fun for people who wish to learn how to mod a cab or even learn more about MAME. As a stock cab, this unit can be fun for the family. When it's modded, it opens up a ton of games for the family to enjoy. 
Believe it or not, this mod isn't done, as I've not done anything to the trackball, and one of the things I'm most excited about is adding buttons to the cab. Make sure you look for those upcoming videos. As far as limitations and things to be aware of, I would very much list the whole Red Player 1 control being the only one with the ability to exit the game, as well as not having select keys for players 2 through 4. This mod is also not as friendly to little kids as the APK only mod, as Retroarch isn't as kiosk-like or dedicated cab-like, and a kid could easily access Retroarch menus and totally mess something up. With all that said, I do want to thank you for checking out this video. I know this one is longer, and it means the world to me that you've checked it out. I'd like to ask that you remember to like, comment, and hit that notification button, and if you've not done so yet, please consider subscribing. These are all small clicks of the mouse for you, but to this small channel, those little clicks mean the world. Thank you.